Hey Robot Makers, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good week so far. So, do you want to know how to build your own musical instrument using a couple of rangefinders, a Raspberry Pi Zero 2, you can actually use any Raspberry Pi, and some Python? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive, let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code, and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our presentation. Yes, yeah, so this is heavily based on the theremin. Uh, if you've not come across that device before, uh, we'll dive into some of that today. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, session goals for today. So this is a work in progress. I'll just put that out there at the moment. This is not a finished project. This is something I'm currently working on. So today we're going to look at what a theremin is, uh, look at how we convert distances to notes for music, um, sending some MIDI data over the network. And this is really easy to do with uh, Python. We'll be creating some notes using rangefinders, connecting to GarageBand on the Mac. You can use um, any MIDI software that will take um, a MIDI input. And uh, we'll be looking very briefly at Fusion 360, the design so far. I'm not quite finished with this design yet, and I'll go through some of the improvements I want to make. And then we'll do a bit of code, and and it's quite simple code, this one. And then we'll do a bit of a demo. Okay, so what is a theremin? You may have heard of these before. Um, so this was created by Leon Theremin, a Russian inventor and spy. If you look at Wikipedia, he uh, invented a little device that was in the Russian embassy called The Thing. And that was hanging there as a recording device for the Russians for a number of years. Um, so he patented this um, almost 100 years ago, 1928. So he probably invented it a few years before. And it's really unusual because the performer does not touch or make any contact with the instrument uh, after they've set this up. They just use their hands um, they have one hand which is moving up and down and they have one that's kind of near the body and they do various different gestures. So um, it was also called a, an etherphone. It had a few different names um, and it has a very strange kind of haunting sound and it was used in lots of 1950s sci-fi movies. So yeah, it's a, a very unusual instrument. There's not many like this. So let's how, see how a theremin actually works. So it's based on gestures. Um, the theremin has two antennas. There's one which is like a loop that goes out to the right hand side and then usually on the right hand side. And then there's one, oh, it's the left hand side, sorry. And then there's one which is sort of straight up. So one of them measures the distance uh, as, as volume. So that's the left hand one. So as you move your, your hand up and down, um, it'll become louder or quieter so as you sort of touch the device it's silent and then as you move your hand up it'll go even louder so if you move your hand away it go like full full volume and then the other one as you move your hand further away or towards um further away from the antenna towards yourself or towards the antenna it will change the pitch of the note that's being played so it's very difficult to actually play this uh, i watched a few videos uh, we'll get onto one of the performers who plays this professionally in a second uh, cavalina and uh, you have to have your body very still and your hand sort of just making very small gestures. And she's come up with an entire uh, sequence of gestures to make each note individually and very accurately. So she can do it by muscle memory. But anything that's in the room can affect this antenna. Any, any bodies, any metal objects, anything that's moving past the field. And the field sort of spans out from the antenna in all directions. So it's very difficult to play because of that. You have to sort of calibrate it as you go. So I was thinking about this. Um, I watched a couple of videos on this and it kind of inspired me to think about how we could do something similar like this. So yes, Carolina is it Eek? <laughs> I'm not sure how you pronounce her surname. So she's a professional uh, theremin player uh, and she's created this entire sort of gesture where you can do various different um, hand gestures. If you watch the videos, it's fascinating to watch. And she can show you how you can play a scale. She plays various different pieces of music on it. And uh, yeah, it's very, and she has a quite a modern theremin as well. It's quite a professional one. So uh, check her out, just Google Carolina uh, and theremin and you'll come across all her good work. So the Therapy, <laughs> this is what I'm calling the device I've invented. So rather than using an antenna and um, sort of capacitance, resistance capacitance. I'm using some range finders because we have a whole bunch of these for the SMARS robot and for things like the Otto DIY. We have these as like the little face on the robot. And I was thinking, well, if we had two of these, uh, I've got one at a 45 degree angle and one that goes straight up. So you could have your hand kind of over here. Let me just go full screen a second. Um, so you'd be able to sort of move your hand away in that way and then up that way. So this would be the volume and this would be the pitch. This would be the note. I'm just going to put that back there a second. 
So very simple for us to, to work with. We've used range finders before in a lot of our code for measuring distance. So what we need to do is change distance into either volume or into a particular tone or pitch for our note. And then we can just take a reading and then we can work out what note is being played. And we can make this a bit easier to play than the theremin. We can kind of quantize this so it's a specific note given a particular distance. So if you're in between, it'll just stick with the previous note until you've reached that threshold a bit further away. So this is a 21st century version of the theremin. So converting distance to notes, um, it's quite simple for us to do this. Uh, the range finder itself measures, it's got an accuracy of about three millimeters, so it's pretty accurate and it has a range of about four meters. So your mileage may vary. Um, I, I found these work up to about um, a meter quite well. Beyond that, it depends on the surfaces, it depends on a lot of the conditions. So we can calibrate this um, to return a value between five centimeters and 50 centimeters. We can basically just ignore everything outside of that and that can be our range. So that's probably about this kind of range. So it's enough for us to be able to get some kind of accuracy as we're moving our hand to get the, the various different notes. Uh, and you can see on the little diagram there, we've got the volume going straight up and the pitch going out 45 degrees. So this is a bit of a diagram that explains how this will work. So there's our range finder, there's an ultrasonic beam going out. And then we've got our 50 centimeters, zero to 50 centimeters is our, is our distance that we're gonna use for this. And then between each of them, roughly every five centimeters, we've got various different notes. So I've just put there a bit of an octave there and a few extra ones. And that's how that would work out um, that's how it would work out, obviously, as, a, as the various different notes um, on, a, on a scale. So that's one way that we can do this. Now, I was thinking about this before and I thought we could actually just make this so the user can calibrate it. So we can use various different mappings. One of my favorite um, functions, which I've covered in my code, is a mapping function. And you can give it a value between two values and then it will map it to another two values, a sort of minimum and maximum. So we can make this user configurable if they want to have a, either a longer range or they want more notes within that 50 centimeters I put there. So we can map this any way we wish. So that takes us on to MIDI. So MIDI is a musical instrument digital interface and it's quite an old standard now. Uh, there's loads of videos out there on the internet about how to use MIDI with Arduinos, with, um, with Python and so on. So this is something that's quite straightforward and quite well tested for us to use. So it's standard for connecting various different devices to make and control sound. The control sounds, it's not just about notes, it's like the velocity of the notes, the, the, uh, the speed, the effects that are applied to the notes. We can change lots of different things. So all those different control signals are sent in what they call a message, a MIDI message. And we can create those using a Python library. Um, so we want to make notes that are produced we want to make notes that produce a rich sound, high quality. So rather than just making the Raspberry Pi make some kind of beep sound, I thought, no, no, let's send some data using MIDI over the network to a computer that's got something a bit better than just a speaker. So I'm going to use GarageBand on the Mac. We can use any uh, MIDI software that will take uh, a MIDI input, which is basically all of them, and we can make it play a nice note through that. So we're gonna we're gonna have a play around with a Python library. We're gonna make some notes be sent across from the Raspberry Pi, and we're gonna interpret them on our GarageBand and play around with that. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. So we're gonna use Mido, which is the Python library for controlling MIDI. Um, it's a great library for Python, very easy to create these messages. We can even read in MIDI files. We'll have a play with that in a minute. We can send and receive MIDI data across a network and they've made that piece of cake to do. Honestly, it's like 10 lines of code. So we can create a very simple sender and receiver script. So I'm gonna have the receiver on the Mac. I'm gonna have the sender on the Raspberry Pi Zero um, and we're gonna send messages based on distances. So this is where this is a work in progress. Um, I had this set up and I was getting really spurious readings from the range finders. And when I went back and reread the, uh, um, the how to on these range finders and it says you need a voltage divider. I'm like, of course they do, it's three volts. So I've been squeezing five volts onto my Raspberry Pi Zero 2. I may well have killed those particular pins by doing that. So that's why this is a work in progress, but we can still play with all the other bits and pieces uh, to get this working. So let's uh, have a look what else we can do on here. So this is how it's gonna work. So the Raspberry Pi, the TheraPi, connects to the, the receiver server on the Mac. 
The script then reads the distance from the two sensors. It converts these to notes and volume. And we'll look at how you do that in the, the MIDI message. Very, very simple for us to do that. And then it creates a message with the note on type and the note with the velocity. And then it sends that message to the receiver and the receiver will then just play it locally on as a, as a MIDI uh, message locally. Okay, so if you like these videos and you want me to make more of these, uh, make sure you like on this video, you comment on it below, tell me if you think this is uh, crazy stuff, whether you think this is good, let me know what you think, and obviously subscribe to the channel, hit that little bell, and uh, you'll know um, if anything else is released um, in any time soon. And I do a new video every single Sunday, 7 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, so that's it's, it, when I put ish, that was because we were in British summertime and it was about an hour out, but I think all the time zones around the world have now synchronised from a, um, daylight savings time. And um, yes, that means at 7 o'clock you'll catch me live and you can join in and uh, have a chat with me about uh, various different projects and so on. So obviously if you want to follow me on social media, I'm all over the place there. So if you go to uh, smilesfan.com slash about and then link underscore in underscore bio, uh, that's on all my social medias as well. So you can catch me on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, obviously, the World Wide Web, smilesfan.com, via email and also on Instagram. So you can get all the links just there. And Alex has just posted a link in the chat as well. So if you go to action.smilesfan.com slash join dash the dash list, you can join the, the mailing list. We will send out a mail this week as well on that one. Okay, so you want to get a copy of this code. Um, it's a work in progress, so it will be changing over the next week or so. If you go to github.com slash kevinmacalier slash therapy, um, you can download and play around with it yourself. So once you've downloaded the code, you've done the clone command, you can then create a virtual environment by doing python3-m and then venv and then venv, and that will create you a virtual environment. You can then activate that virtual environment by doing source, We'll, we'll do this in a minute on the demo. VM bin activate, and that will activate that virtual environment. And then you can then install all the, the libraries which we need. So let's have a look at some of those libraries uh, in action in a second. So in my GitHub repository, there is a couple of files. There is basic MIDI or MIDI basic. This is a test program to make sure MIDI works on your, your local machine that's got like garage band or whatever running. It'll basically just create some MIDI messages for notes and just play them. Uh, there is a receiver script, that's, so that's the server in effect, so that's going to receive messages from our Raspberry Pi. And then there is the Therapy main file itself, so that will... Um, have I spelled that right? That's Therapy, I think it's Therapy with an I. That's the main uh, application script that we can use, which is the work in progress bit. And then the requirements.txt has all the different um, libraries that we need to install. So we use pip dash r and then requirements.txt and it will just install all them automatically and it'll make sure everything just works as you would expect it to. So the first one, midi basic.py is a test program. So let's have a look at this. So we've got a couple of comments to begin with from lines one to four. Then we import Mido. So Mido is the library that's going to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to MIDI. Um, so it's basically MIDI objects for Python. That's what it stands for. So from MIDI, uh, Mido, we import message. That's going to be the thing that creates these tone messages, these notes for us. And from time, we import sleep because we're just going to put a sleep in between our test thing. So to connect to our local MIDI device, uh, our local MIDI environment. So I'm on a Mac. So the name of my uh, driver is IAC driver bus one. And if I go over to the audio MIDI setup on my Mac, you can see here, this is um, an application that's just called MIDI, Audio MIDI Setup. And if we click on there, we've just activated this by clicking it, Devices Online. That's the name that's displayed. That's the same name that we need to put in our, um, in our Python script. Now, we can add extra buses, extra MIDI channels, all that kind of stuff if we want. But we're just going to stick with one for now because that's nice and simple. So let's go back over to our Keynote. And so that's the, the line there, AIC. The next one, port, is the port that we want to open. So we want to create a variable that's called port. We want Mido to open that so that we can then send messages to it. And it's as simple as that. So the next line, 13 and 14. 14 is just a, a little dictionary full of notes. So 60, 65, 70, 71, 72 are different notes. They, they correspond to um, like middle C, that kind of thing. And then we have a loop, so while true, 
and for each note in that notes dictionary there it will say message equals message which comes from our Mido library it passes it the note on command and then it says the note that we want to play is the note that it's currently looping through and then we say port.send and we send that message that we just created port is our connection to our local thing we print it out as well just so we can see what's happening and then we sleep for half a second so we're going to run that um, now and we're going to have a play and see what actually happens so let's break out our terminal let's get into here and i'll just deactivate my environment for a second deactivate so i've downloaded the code if i just do a list we can see a list long we can see there we've got midi basic that's the one that we're going to play with that we've just looked at so to activate this environment i do source i then do virtual environment binary and then activate and it will say in brackets vn for there and now i can just type in python and midi basic and we can hear some haunting sounds that's those notes so let's go over to garage band and see what's happening i'm just going to turn that down a little bit so it's not drowning me out so if we bring up the MIDI keyboard in here, show MIDI keyboard, we can see the notes being pressed there. And they're the messages that are being sent. So if I go back over to that terminal, we can see each of those notes being sent to the local MIDI device. And it'll keep doing that until I stop that loop. But we can play, the reason I wanted to do this is that we can play with, let's make sure that's not too loud. We can play with the, the different instruments. So if we want to go for Let's go for a vintage organ. Do I need to just uh, close that? Let's go for a vintage organ. Um, it's struggling with that. All right, there we go. That's why. And let's go for organ B3. That sounds strange. for a guitar very haunting you get the idea but we can do things like add reverb so if we just turn it up a little bit so let's just stop that now there we go clear that okay so that's part one we've just looked at how we can create some notes we can send them to our local midi interface and then we can play them so that's just running on the mac that currently isn't running on the raspberry pi itself so we're going to look at part two of the code which is the receiver so this receiver will be the thing that's the server that sits on our apple mac and or, or windows or linux pc and actually plays it to the midi device itself so it's a little bit longer this one so we've got a couple more um comments there we import Mido like we did before we import the message we're also now importing the sockets and port server and that's the thing that's going to be the server uh, I've commented out there this MIDI ports and port we don't need that on this one and then I've set up um, a host and a port so the host is the IP address of this uh, Mac that I'm currently using the port is just a local port that we've um, got free you could use 8000 I've used 8080 and then we do the thing that we did before which is setting up the IAC so the IAC driver bus and then the port we've set that up before but now we want to set up a port server so we say with port server we pass it the host which is the IP address we pass it the port which is at 8080 as a server and then we then say the server is started and then while true so repeat this loop forever and I've just wrapped this in a couple maybe I've gone a bit over the top here but a couple of try accept blocks that means if there's an error it will catch that error and continue working so it just gives it a little bit more robustness although it's not thoroughly robust so then we try client equals server.accept so that means wait for anything to connect once it's connected then we we have something to work with we've got this client um, if it has any kind of error it will just say oops an error caught and then for message we say messaging client so every time a message comes through we want to do something with it so we want to send that message to the port we want to print that out and if there's any kind of error again we just want to say oops error caught and then the other one there is if there's a keyboard interrupt so if i press Control and c i want it to sort of close that port and then stop the program from running cleanly 
So that's what our receiver one will do. Uh, what I'm going to do as well is I'm, I'm going to run this one on the Mac and then I'm going to hop over to the Raspberry Pi Zero and I'm going to run a local MIDI file. We're going to read in a MIDI file. Uh, so that's in the, the player. So if we go to Visual Studio, let me just bring this one up and I can quickly show you the code for this because it's very simple. So here we are over in uh, Visual Studio. So actually it's not not DAS boot. This one is going to be takata.mid. Let's just change that as well. Takata.mid. And let's just zoom in a little bit so we can see that a bit easier. Let's just hide that over there. So again, we've got the usual kinds of things. We are reading in um, the usual libraries, but now we've got MIDI, uh, sorry, mido.midi files, import MIDI file. And that means we can read in MIDI files just by including that. Um, we then, we have the host, the port, the file name, and then we have an, um, an output port. Before we use the variable called port, so I've just called it output on this one. And then we say print starting MIDI player, we then for message in MIDI file to carter.mid.play, print out the message that it's reading in, and then send them to that local um, device. So it's gonna it's going to connect to local host. Now I do need to change that to be the IP address of the machine that we're working on so that that works. I think it's to 1.229, I think. Um, so I've got the Raspberry Pi set up over here. So what we're going to do in a second, let's just, uh, oops, let's just list on here. And let's have a look what's going on. So yes, we have takata.mid. I've just downloaded this from a free MIDI site. Um, and we're going to play that file using the MIDI player. So that's the code that we just looked at. So before we do that, we need to hop back over to the Mac. We need to run um, our receiver. So MIDI receiver. So that's now started, it's waiting. Now we're gonna go back over here to our Raspberry Pi Zero. We're gonna do Python and we're gonna do um, MIDI player. I'm not promising it's gonna be any good. It's like a Spanish guitar version. Let's find an organ that's more suited to this. Now, the quality of the MIDI file might not be great as well. There is that. Let's add a bit of reverb to that. things there so you get the idea it reads in the MIDI file we get all the messages sent there so we can see there loads of information and we can have a look at that we've got note on note off we've got channel zero which is the channel that we're using we've got the note itself which is those numbers we've got the velocity which is how hard the key is being hit and then we've got time which is just when is it playing the, the note so let's just go back over to our Raspberry Pi press control C and it's now stopped that. It does actually crash the server. I've not managed to make it not crash the server when you press Control C on the other machine. So just need to remember that while we, we're doing that. So that's that. Um, okay, let's have a look what else we are looking at today. So that was our receiver pie. Uh, part two was the sender, right. So this is the thing that's going to send the notes um, and we just we just read in a MIDI file. What we can do now instead is just play those same six notes that we looked at, we heard before, those haunting notes. <laughs> there they are in that little array. We're going to connect to the server, which is running on the Mac. So we'll run this on the, the Raspberry Pi. We'll say starting MIDI sender, and then it will just loop through each of those notes in that note array. Um, it will say uh, message equals message, note on, note equals note. Velocity is 127, which is like the, ha the highest hardest amount you can press a key so it's not soft it's um, like full down um, the output dot send will send that message to the server and then we just print it out wait half a second uh, and then just loop through and then if we do the keyboard interrupt I've made this one a bit more um, 
verbose now because what was happening when I was cancelling it the keys were still being sort of pressed in because there was no note off so the MIDI device was just holding those notes so I say for note in notes basically all those notes there send the message note off um, to the server and then close the port then stop the program so it's a little bit more involved that one so let's try that I'll go back over to our um, Raspberry Pi I'm gonna sorry this is on the the Mac the receiver is on the Mac We'll go back over to the Raspberry Pi and now we will run the sender. So instead of MIDI player, let's do the sender. Let's go back to piano on that one. There we go. So if we wanted to, we could re record this. <laughs> Don't need the metronome on. There we go. And if we wanted to, we could edit those notes and do all the good stuff that you can do in, um, in GarageBand. So there we go. Okay, let's just stop that from running. Let's go to the Raspberry Pi. Let's just do Control C. And you hit it, it's good, dun, dun, and it then sent those messages and then it quit. So we don't have any notes being held. Um, so we can just clear that as well. Clear that as well. Okay, let's go back to our, our keynote. So a bit more involved that one, but still not too many lines of code. Quite straightforward for us to understand. So next steps. So what I need to do to make this actually work in, and I'm sorry if I'm disappointing you today by not actually having this plugged in. Um, these four just connect into the, um, I've actually got it in front of me on the desk. Sort of. Oops, <laughs> desk in front of me down here. So that's actually plugged in and it's just got the, the header pins and these just connect up to, um, I think it's pins um, 20, 27 and there's, a, there's another bunch as well for the other. So I'm, I'm, I was basically just concentrating on the tone for now and then just the volume would be very simple to add to. So I just need to put a voltage divider in between these and the Raspberry Pi so that I don't blow out um, the chip because it is 3.3 volts, not 5 volts. Uh, once I've done that, then it will re read the range properly and that will work almost guaranteed. It's very simple code to read a range finder. We'll have a look at the code in a second because it is a bit different than what we've used previously because this is like full Python. Um, I also need to rework the design a little bit because this um, little chassis that I built, um, I designed this in Fusion 360 and it's designed, if I just take this off for a second, I just grab this Raspberry Pi Zero that I've got here. Let's just go back full screen for a second. I've just got this in one of these little cases. Okay. And in here, I've got some little nodules on the bottom. You can just about see them there. And this Raspberry Pi fits into there and sits nicely on those nodules. So it sits in place. Now, just it is a bit fiddly to get this in place, but it does sit there. Let's just do that. There we go. So you can see there, the Raspberry Pi Zero is sat in there. Those little nodules mean that it's um, it's nice, firmly sat in place. Now, the problem is, you can just see the memory card reader there. I've not left enough space for the memory card reader to sit there with a the memory card in. If I grab um, a Zero, Let's grab one that's got a header and the memory card. You can probably just about see there, the memory card sticks out a bit. So I hadn't allowed about five millimeters for that to work. I did allow enough space for the, the headers to sit there with wires plugged in, so there's plenty of room in there for that. But there is also no holes on the side to be able to connect the wires up. So I just need to do a bit of a redesign on that um, for that to be able to work. But the, the nodules work quite well. They do hold it in place nicely. So that's one of the first things I need to do in Fusion 360. Um, so I need to make the, yeah, the gaps a bit larger with a gap for the memory card and some holes so you can put the cables in as well. Uh, I'll share the STL files once I've done that. Um, the range finders themselves use the SMARS um, um, holders. So you can just see the range finder there 
these push in really nicely so there's no screws required there's no glue or anything they just sit in place quite nicely there and i have got these covers which we have for the smiles robots um, we can have those as well like you get the idea what i did need to do um, as an adjustment on one of them which one is it that one is the yellow one um, when i was designing this as well i designed it ever so slightly wrongly so the yellow one has to be a bit has to be three millimeters where the normal one's about two and a half um, so that means that it can slide in into place just on that diagonal like so and then the other one just slides into place doesn't matter which way around these go but there we go so that can sit on a on a surface and you can then use your hands to control the the sound and these just plug into the the headers on the raspberry pi so they're, they're the steps i need to do next so part three let's have a look at the therapy code itself uh, and then we'll get on to a mailbag so let's just have a quick look at the code itself so let me go over to visual studio let's load up the therapy code so there we go therapy let's just close that so there's a bit more going on in this one so we're importing distance sensor so i'm using the gpio gpio zero um, python library so that enables you to connect to the raspberry pi uh, headers and one of the things that it has as a built-in type is distance sensor so you can use the distance sensor you just pass in a trigger and an echo pin and it will take care of everything else so whereas we've normally had to create our own code you know measuring the speed of sound dividing it by two and all that they do all that for you so it's nice and simple we then import um i think we import Mido, but don't use it we import Mido message as we've done before the sockets to connect it to a server I also import Pygame. So Pygame has got a really nice MIDI um, module as part of it. And it has this frequency to MIDI. So you can um, read in a frequency such as 60, and then it will convert that to the nearest note. So you can see some examples there. So they passed in 27 and a half, and it said the nearest one is 21. We pass in 36.7, the nearest one is 26, and so on. So that's the function I use to sort of quantize which note depending on the distance that's been provided. Uh, and then there we go gpio zero distance sensor i think there's a bit of replication going on there we can probably get rid of one of them we have the host and the port as we have before we then have the two range finders so we say volume and pitch um, so you can see the pins that they're connected to so 20 to 21 22 and 27 i may need to change those because i might have burnt them out but <laughs> we'll find out uh, and here's my favorite function in all of python uh, which can take a value x and then it can take an in value and an, um, a minimum in value a minimum sorry a minimum in value a maximum in value a minimum out value and a maximum out value and it will tell you what the new value is depending on what x is provided it's very clever for mapping two ranges of numbers so if you wanted to do it as a percentage you pass in x as like you know five and it would work out what that would be as a percentage five percent but you could also have another range like between zero between five and fifty if you wanted that as your your distance it will tell you what that that is so i'll create this some helper function so distance to frequency so if we we map in a value um which is distance so whatever the distance is that's being read we can say this is between five and forty uh, and between sixty and 120 so five and forty could be the distance i think we were actually using 5 to 50 on our example and 60 to 120 would be you know it's a note between those two ranges we can do another one which is distance to velocity so again that we pass in the the value of distance that we read in from the range finder we map it between 5 and 50 which is the range that we're working with and then it, that's a, a, a number between 0 and 127 which is the the midi values for velocity and we just pass those back so they're really simple pieces of code to read in and then create midi messages from that so distance to note um, converts the distance read from the range finder to a note so the note equals the frequency to midi and we pass in the distance that's been read which has been passed in and return the note um, the output is the the way that we connect to our, our midi device uh, we then say starting therapy sender and then while true we read in a distance we we would also read in the volume as well 
Uh, for this one, I've just hard-coded the velocity to 127 just while I get one of them working. We then do the frequency equals distance to frequency, the note equals frequency to MIDI, and then the message equals note on the note that we've just detected, the velocity that we've just detected, and the time is zero. And then we send that, and that will work. So that's all we need to do to get that working once I've put my um, voltage divider in place. Uh, and that's it. That will be our therapy working. I'll put a, I'll post a video of me playing this when it actually does work. I'll try and figure out something that I can play <laughs> reasonably simply with this new instrument that I've created. So what do you think? Is it crazy creating a new instrument? <laughs> Is that something that you'd be interested in? Okay, so we'll go over to the mailbag and then we'll look at some comments from people in the chat. So this week we can see we have a few new things in our mailbox. So one of the messages on the small robots facebook group or possibly um, a youtube video there's somebody asking could i have a play with rf tags so let's just open one of these up and have a quick look what we've got here and they look pretty simple electronically speaking to be able to work so we've got a couple of header pins there we have um, the rf RC50, sorry, 522, that's the actual board. And the idea is you have these cards and you just boop it there and it will read. There's a chip that's inside here and you can code and encode, encode them, decode them. You've got a fob, which is the same kind of thing that you can place on the sensor. And then you basically just put the header pins in here and then read the values. So a couple of header pins. I'm not sure if this is I squared C or if this is SPI. Looks like it does all of them actually. It's got SDA, SC, SCK, which is uh, I squared C. So that should be pretty straightforward to get working. There's loads of libraries around for these as well. So I've got three of them. We can have a play with that and we can make our own RFID tag thing. So that's one thing that somebody requested. And then the next one is um, something that Adam sent through. So this is a interesting bag of bits. We have a, an M5 stack board there. We have a proto unit, which is like a build your own M5 stack thing. You can solder things on there and you've got all the little nice connectors. They're called groove connectors. And um, we've got a stamp as well, five stamp C3. There we go. So that's just in there. I'll just get that out. We can have a look at that. So this is a very small, uh, computer, microcontroller, I should say. Um, you can see it's got a bunch of uh, header pins on it there. Uh, the thing I like about these is the way that the uh, um, the buttons work. So on here we've got two buttons. If we press those little bits that they sort of push in, like so. So it's like a reset, and, and then there's a nice little sticker that goes on top there that tells you there's a reset button, and there is a a button that sort of uses a programmable there as well. So there's a bunch of header pins and things that go with that, so that's nice. Uh, what else have we got in here? We have a stamp Pico. So this is what I think I've actually got one of these um, in my other bunch of stuff. So I've not actually opened this one up yet. Let's just uh, grab something to open this up with. So it's similar to, to the stamp, but it's even smaller. You can see there just how much smaller that is. Again, it's got the programmable button, reset button, and a whole bunch of header pins that we can uh, we can solder into place. Like so. Oops. And the other thing I like about this is it has this little connector that we can solder into place so that we've got the nice groove connector on there as well. So that can connect up. So that's good. That also comes with a sticker so we can put that in place there. Um, we have the... Um, like a power unit for that as well so we can apply power to it but um, Adam would say don't do that and have it connected to the USB at the same time otherwise it, it sort of blows the thing up and uh, yes I, I need a bit more information about how to get this one working Adam I think um, it looks like it works with the the Pico um, but I'm not sure not sure the best way to to plug this in and what I need to do there so I'll have a look through those instructions uh, that you've sent through um, and I'll connect up using the spare wire that I've got in there as well cool 
So let's have a look at some of the, the comments in the chat and see Adam's given me some advice there and I shall uh, I shall read through that diligently in a second. So let's scroll all the way to the top and see what people are talking about. Okay, so Richard was making a coffee early on. How did the coffee go? Was it, uh, was it nice? We have a, a nice coffee machine in our kitchen. Um, so yeah, Adam says, hey everyone, just wait for the adverts to finish. I always wonder whether you see the adverts or not. I always put the monetization stuff on uh, just so the show can pay for itself. Uh, but I don't know how what that, what the impact is to you watching that. And Adam says, you've got a working Fusion 360. I'm so upset. So tell me about what's up with your Fusion 360 setup. Um, mine seems working okay. Midsummer Murder uses the theremin. Yes, they, they use it for that sort of ghosty, spooky kind of effect. One of the reasons for that is because it's so hard to get the distance right just using your hand. One of the ways you can sort of trick your ear into thinking it's hearing a specific note is to do that. <laughs> so it sounds like, like a woo 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 rather than holding it because you'll hear that it's off, off key. And if you breathe, the, the very act of your chest moving out changes the pitch so you can't breathe while you're doing these things if you watch the uh, carolina video she, she talks all about that stuff yeah billy ba bill bailey is good with it so is um i think sheldon plays it in uh, big bang theory as well i think he actually did play the star trek theme on that um <laughs> Midsummer uses the theremin in its opening theme. Interesting fact, Midsummer Norton, the fictitious area, is set in an actual place in Somerset called Midsummer Norton. I did not know that. Bizarre. Um, so, yes, Adam is clicking the thumbs up because he's saying, uh, yes, if you want to follow me on any of the socials, I do actually have like a little pop-up thing that's got them on, actually. So you can see um, I'm on Facebook group Small Robots. You can at me at Instagram, KevsMac on Twitter and smarsfan.com is the website. And yes, Alex has posted up as well. If you want to um, join the mailing list, and we will send out some messages on that, I promise. Um, you can go to actionsmarsfan.com, join the list, and you can join our mailing list. It's a very exclusive list, you know. We don't just let anybody in. <laughs> and um, let's have a look what else we've got. So Alex was saying, for those just joining, we're looking at the code for the notes that the theremin will be able to play. Absolutely. So we had a listen to a very poor rendition of to the Carter on Fugue. Um, it's one of my favourite pieces as well. I liked it. It was in the film um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, Captain Nemo plays it on this big organ in the, the Nautilus, so I quite like that too. And then Richard says, with regards to the case, why not make the bass slide in um, so it's not that, so that the pie can be in place and wired up? Yes, many ways of doing that. I went with this single piece design. Um, I actually just started with a smart chassis. So this started out as being the 70 by 58 centimeters extruded up by 30, 32 millimeters. And then I tweaked it so that it would fit. I, I brought in, I went to grab CAD. I downloaded um, a Raspberry Pi Zero um, model. I then inserted that into here so that I could get all the different measurements. I did actually measure up using my... Um, digital caliper I had a Raspberry Pi and just measured all the different distances and um, that worked fine as we can see because it does actually hold it just didn't allow enough space for a card or and it's quite frustrating because it was a 13 hour print that that took quite a while it's quite it's quite substantial um, it's, that's, you, you always have to iterate with these things um, so Adam says you might be able to get the RFID working over I squared C if you connect it to port A of the fire ah interesting so I do have a fire here so I could connect that to port A of the fire. So port A is, you can see port C and B. Where's port A? Is that port A? Is that port A there? I see port B and C are there. So I'm guessing that's A there with my little fire. So yes, I'll have a play with that and see if we can get the RFID working on there as well. Um, so yeah, Adam's got a smiley face there as well. <laughs> it's like Christmas. It is actually like Christmas in our house as well. Uh, we've been <laughs> some decorating a little bit earlier than the normal, because why not? So Adam says, uh, did I not send the PSU in the bag? I did have this thing. Is that the PSU? I've not actually got like the plug-in power supply, but if, is, it, um, is it 9 volts? No, 5 to 24 volts. So yeah, it'll take any standard kind of um, voltage thing. Do you know why people do this when, when they're showing something on a video? They hold it up and it, and it sort of struggles to find it. It's face detection. The Sony camera is looking for my face. If I sort of hide my face, it finds it a lot easier um, 
to zoom in and as soon as my face appears um, it will then track to my face the other camera that i've got the overhead has a different mode it has product mode so as you bring something close to it it will keep the focus so i don't have to do anything and it's really slick as you can see there that's the uh the power unit uh, so what else the board is the board if for the p code the c3 board it's not even been started yet wow that's amazing prototype stuff um i'm common it was instant coffee <laughs> so it's okay <laughs> I like coffee either way when i remember working at hewlett packard and they had a, a vending machine and, and that gave free coffee and i was just like constantly at that machine it was awful coffee but it was free so it's better than just water so it says my fusion 360 is still it's broken since apple update so i'm on the latest apple update i think uh, my fusion 360 works okay i'll fire it up and see what happens but i've been i use it to design um the case Hey Tom, how's it going? Good to have you over here. Mine too, Adam, but then I reinstalled it today with my Windows 11 PC and now it works again. So I've heard Microsoft are gonna make Windows 11 uh, work on any PC. There's like a registry entry now and you can just sort of get it working without the TP, TPM2 chip. I think you do need a TPM chip of some sorts, but um, yeah, I've got many PCs and I'm a bit frustrated that it doesn't even work on the, I've got a Surface Pro 3 tablet that doesn't work properly right so i've got fusion 360 open here i'm just going to open up the uh, the model so we can have a quick look at that and then i shall go over to it over here so uh, so i'm with i'm on um do i want to do that let me just quickly open that and check what version i'm on i just need to hide um my serial number I do that does that no I can't risk that so I'm on Monterey I'm on version 12.0.1 and fusion is working fine there um, they might have updated something recently I don't know how I figure out what version of fusion I'm on 2.0.11415 but I think it's on 10.16.0 that's weird but yeah it's working fine uh, as fine as fusion works so let's put our layout grid back on oops and i can show you the raspberry pi in situ right i moved it and it it left all the little pieces behind so there's all the little circuits and everything i did like a, a joint um like joint in place and for some reason it just decided to leave all those bits and pieces so i could probably switch all those off it's just the board that i really wanted to know about let's just move them and then if we do um section analysis through let's see if we can get that to work not that one that one there let's look in the middle we can see there that the raspberry pi is sat very nicely on those little stubby leg things and this little rounded knobbly bit at the top that pokes through and makes it just sort of lock into place so yeah, I just need to um, have some areas for the, the memory card and also for the power and um, video and so on. So there we go. So yeah, it started out, if I just go back to the very beginning one, uh, turn off that section analysis and go over to here. And uh, let's make sure we can see all the different work features turn off that you can see there 58 by 72 made it two millimeters longer than the uh, standard smiles robot and then i just extruded that up and so on so i'll not go through the entire build of that but yeah fusion things be working fine for me not sure what the issue there is that you guys have got um maybe it's a windows bug so richard says adam does fusion 360 use mono by chance on the mac mono haven't the foggiest <laughs> okay so apple patched a security flaw in the intel graphics driver which broke fusion 360 i see so i'm on a mac m1 i don't know if that makes a difference i'm not on the the pro or the max i'm on the original m1 so yes 
that Alex says he does a lot more printing now of the 3D printer is no longer in the lounge making noise. That's right, I've got two. I've got the power of two printers now. So they're constantly, it means that printing things is a bit quicker if you can sort of split the design out. So that's why they're in different colored. Um, that's why they're then bits of white and the rest of it's yellow. It meant I could fabricate different things at the same time, which is good. All right, yeah, port A is the red port. That makes sense, yes. Thank you for that. So PS PSU should be in a bag of its own. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> don't worry, Adam. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I'll have a good look at them and I'll have a play with, uh, see what I can get working with them. So my Fusion 360 closed directly after I started it. So I uninstalled it, downloaded the latest version, reinstalled it. As mentioned, Fusion 360 works again. Uh, they do sometimes have patches where it breaks Fusion completely. Um, it is a bit annoying how it insists on you updating things when things are quite stable um, and apple are not great sometimes they have good months sometimes they have bad months when it comes to patching particularly if they're pushing out like apple tv apple watch ios and the mac software and is there any others an ipad os all in the same you know time period that's a lot of work going on so i think they let a few things slip put google eyes on it that's a really good idea do you see james bruton's um like a snake robot thing that he built that had Google eyes on the version two. <laughs> so that's awesome. Tried three times, eek. That's not good. And then Asm says, uh, I meant to, I, I meant to do not connect external power to the PCB when there is an FTDI connected. Yes. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't do that uh, anyway, just, <laughs> just as a precaution. The bug is with Catalina, I see. Um, and that caused it to crash on startup. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So you're on a 2012 MacBook Pro. If I had a um, 2015 MacBook Pro before this one, and then I had just like loads of random issues. I think it was like a, a memory issue, but I took it to Apple and they said everything checks out, but it still crashed. So I thought, well, it's time to buy a new one anyway. And we upgraded that. So yes, that was our mailbag and a bit of an update on the chat. So... I've got some fantastic guests lined up. I can't wait to share with you who these people are. You'll be blown away. I certainly was when they said, yeah, sure, in the new year. So um, I'll, I'll reveal who that is once I've cleared it with them and we've got a date booked in and we can sort of, um, we can warm up to that event happening. But it's uh, an unbelievable guest. I cannot wait to, tell, to talk to this person and uh, share what they're working on and so on. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm going to see if there's some other guests we can line up as well. Um, I think there's two people who we've got uh, in the bag uh, and there's another a third one. Uh, I just need to sort of hook up with and uh, get them on the show. Not only how you guys found these uh, these uh, interviews. I really like them. I really like meeting other people who have the same kind of interest I do in robotics. Um, and it's just interesting to see what they're working on and the kind of struggles and challenges that they have and how, how they overcome them. So thank you for watching um, today. I really enjoyed this one. I will get this one working and I will post up some videos of me playing some really bad music. <laughs> and uh, I'll let you, I'll have to let me know what you think about that. Um, so if, I don't think there's anything else to share. So I shall uh, let you get back to what you're doing. So thank you for watching and I shall see you next time. Bye for now.